Cool. All right, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Kelly. Uh, I'm a business consultant and I'm a founder uh, of a consultancy called Stateless. And my background is actually in software engineering, so I work with, uh, with startups working in their core systems. And over the last few years, um, I've sort of made my way uh, into the banking world via uh, the world of fintech. Uh, so I built uh, one of the um, Challenger Bank's core, core banking systems in the first six months. Um, I'm also the author of an API format, which makes me supposedly somewhat of an API expert. Uh, it's used all over the world by some of the biggest companies, including uh, Microsoft, uh, Terminos, which I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with, uh, and even uh, Amazon used it in a couple of the latest um, AWS APIs. Um, so our consultancy... Uh, just, just to give you some context of where I'm coming from, is founded uh, on the principle of taking a sort of uh, product-first approach uh, to APIs and, and trying to help businesses find uh, the business value uh, in APIs. So I thought I'd get started by uh, making friends and getting everybody to warm, by me, uh, warm to me by telling you that you're probably going to fail at APIs. That's my hypothesis. So, um, uh, and I guess this is probably your reaction. Uh, that would be a fair reaction, uh, but hopefully um, I can... Uh, uh, I can convince you that uh, this, might, this might actually be the case. So I think uh, the, the thing uh, that's sort of uh, likely to make this the case, in my opinion, uh, is that this is a new kind of problem for, um, uh, for, for an incumbent bank. So you are, what, essentially what you're doing uh, is you're, you're trying to solve a problem uh, of product design. You have a, a product that you need to build from scratch, uh, and it needs a completely different approach uh, from the one that you're used to. So we refer to that in the startup world as something like early stage product design. So it should be managed and it should be run like any other kind of early stage product design. This is something that people from startups are very used to doing and they do day in, day out. So, I mean, at a very high level, uh, the kind of activity um, that goes on when you do this is continuous delivery, user testing, feedback, and iteration. The two main objectives, uh, in my opinion, are that you should be trying to create business value and solve user needs. Um, and uh, I don't know how many friends I'll make by saying this, but uh, I don't think banks have done a terribly good job of that over the last few years. Um, so, I mean, at this point, when I start talking about this stuff, this is where uh, challenger banks will say something like this. Uh, and you know it's a challenger bank because you can see by all the emojis that it's definitely something that they've said. It says, our API is amazing. We're great at product development and solving user needs. The problem with that is they don't have any users. So <laughs> that's where you all go like this. Ha ha, business. Like, we're winning. This is in the bag. We don't really need to do anything. The problem is there's two reasons that you're definitely uh, likely to fail, and those are not getting to market and building the wrong thing. And this is something that you're experts in, as far as I can tell. So, um, uh, so, so well, I mean, what are some of the reasons that you won't get to market? So, I mean, there's obvious stuff that I'm sure everybody here knows about. Politics, process, culture, lack of focus. Actually, uh, one of the things in lack of focus, and I know some people have been talking about it recently, uh, and I probably, again, won't make, I'm, just, I'm making zero friends here, but um, don't get distracted by industry standards. So in my opinion, uh, standards are, can be useful, uh, and, and they can be productive for the industry. Um, but I think uh, just getting involved in um, committees and design by committee uh, and, and obsessing uh, over a strategy that is, is dependent and coupled to the activities of, uh, of standards bodies is, is not a wise move. Um, often, um, I mean, history will show in the technology world that often the most successful standards were started with an implementation. So if you look at any successful standard like TCP IP or HTTP, those were started with an implementation. Tim Berners-Lee came up with a design, but then he wrote a web server. Uh, and I think, uh, in my opinion, it's much more likely that um, the perfect open banking API is more likely to emerge uh, from the industry than it is through a bunch of people in a room all chatting with each other and arguing about how you represent a value date on a transaction. Um, I mean, it, at the end of the day, if there are discrepancies between the APIs, so let's just imagine a world in which all the APIs go forwards, uh, all the banks go forwards with their APIs, and they all create different kind of uh, different APIs with different kinds of terminology, uh, different structures. Uh, I think if there was really a problem with that, and I don't think there are really enough banks to represent a significant problem, but let's, for argument's sake, let's say that it was, uh, I think that obviously the market can solve that problem. Uh, and I think that we should do more as an industry to actually just focus on delivering stuff rather than just talking about stuff in uh, uh, committees. So ultimately, if you don't ship, so if you don't deliver something, 
Um, the, this causes the problem that you don't learn from your users. So if you don't ship stuff to production, you don't learn from your users. And if you don't learn from your users, you're going to build the wrong thing. So these two are very tightly coupled together. If you, if you don't get to market, then you're not going to learn from your users. And if you don't learn from your users, then you're going to end up building the wrong thing. So a lot of people at the moment, or not a lot of people, but some banks are doing stuff like sandboxes and hackathons, and that's fine. I mean, sandboxes and hackathons will teach you something to some degree, but it's relatively shallow, to be honest. So the real way to learn about whether or not um, uh, whether or not you're solving the right problem is to get something into production, put it in front of real users, and solve real problems. And that's the difference between you know, sandboxes and hackathons with enthusiastic people versus production customers uh, and business partners that you have relationships. And those are completely different dynamics and, and will produce completely different types of insight. I think uh, it's very important to get to that real uh, production insight as quickly as possible. So I guess the question now is, now what? That's great. You've told us we're screwed. Like, What are we going to do? Um, the first thing I'd say is for your internal projects is have a look at uh, GDS uh, and also have a really good, good look at this. It's called the Government Service Design Manual. This is basically a playbook uh, that they use inside the government, and this has like, radically changed um, the, the, the output of uh, what is essentially you know, a, a government organization. So if the argument is, oh, we're in a large organization, we can't possibly you know, operate in this agile fashion, we can't possibly deliver continuously, we can't, this is not something that we're capable of, uh, a team of very, very smart people have done this inside of a government organization, so I, I don't really accept that argument, to be honest. But okay, I mean, even if, even if, you, even if you do take the, the, the best approach properly, uh, the, the best approach as possible, I understand that you're in large organizations and there's large amounts of bureaucracy. So, I mean, that's almost unavoidable, and so, in my opinion, uh, you may want to hedge against... Um, uh, hedge against maybe some of the risks that your internal teams won't be able to deliver on the timelines that you need to in order to sort of uh, uh, de-risk the project. And so um, the sort of the hedge against that, if you like, um, uh, and you, I guess you can learn a little bit more about this uh, next up, but I believe that the hedge against that is TELUS. So uh, in my opinion, uh, this guy has spent the last 18 months uh, solving this problem for you. He's de-risked. Uh, your delivery, and he's given you an opportunity to get to market immediately, or virtually immediately, depending on how long it takes you to do um, contractual arrangements with him. Um, but uh, this guy has figured out how to take an existing asset that you have in market uh, and turn it into something that you can uh, get into production, use with real customers, uh, and start figuring out uh, how, how APIs work in practice, not just in theory and, uh, and in hackathons. Uh, so I would employ you to go and chat with that guy and figure out uh, how, how you can do business with him, because I think there's a, a mutually beneficial relationship to be had there. Um, so I have a little bit of skin in the game here, because um, as well as being the founder of Stateless, uh, I'm actually also the founder of a project called Ching. So Ching was something that started inside of Stateless, and it was spun out uh, earlier on this year. Uh, we raised venture capital funding in May, uh, and uh, now we have a team of people building the core system and, and the product. And basically, uh, Ching is, is founded on the principle uh, or on the belief that uh, the banking uh, or the bank card system uh, was not designed or was never designed with the internet in mind. So we've come up with an alternative payment model that works via APIs uh, and bank transfers uh, for real-time customer payments uh, online, in store, uh, and amongst friends as well. Um, so we're basically looking to engage with banks uh, via whatever channel possible. Uh, and currently, our strategy is to go to market in Q1 next year, and we'll be partnering with Teller. So um, if anybody wants to come and talk to us about that, um, we'd love to start that dialogue. Um, I can talk a little bit more um, about how the app works, uh, how the business model works. Essentially, it's, as I said, it's bank transfers. It's a, it's a payment network that consumers log into uh, with their bank account. Uh, when the payments are instructed, it's authorized via mobile device. Uh, the payment's instructed uh, as a bank transfer, so the uh, transaction fees are an order of magnitude lower than the card networks, uh, and we charge the merchants uh, a transaction fee. Uh, the idea is to work with banking API providers uh, on a revenue share basis, uh, and so I think uh, we'd like to start that dialogue as soon as possible. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to talk about that, come and meet me afterwards or, or, or send me an email. So, I mean, that's pretty much uh, the end of the talk. Um, I realized I was probably maybe too succinct. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or challenges about some of the stuff that I said. Anyone? Yep, we've got a question here. 
So you said that you could only learn from users by shipping something. Are you really sure about that? Yes. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a prototype or like a dummy thing, you know, that you can give to people before it's built? Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, that's shipping something, right? Okay. I, I, I mean, like, I just mean shipping anything, anything that you can learn from. So okay. I, I didn't mean you have to ship like a full system. That's very important. And actually, like, that's, yeah. that's a really good point. Yeah. So I see like quite a lot of, um, at least the banks that I've, I've made contact with, a lot of them are approaching APIs um, in a sort of very sort of, this is, a, this is a massive project, we need to develop everything and then dump it into production. Uh, and I think um, one of the things that, that needs to be done is, is taking a more sort of strategic, iterative approach. So in my opinion, identity is something that banks can carve out and they can manage and they can deliver in isolation. The good thing about that is there's relatively little risk in that. So if you have, I don't know, some kind of app that has some problem with identity and they need to identify customers, you can offer third parties the opportunity to log in with their bank account. That gives those you know, that gives those third parties a relatively high level of confidence that the, the person is who they say they are. I don't know whether they could use it for, for KYC. Um, but I think that that whole issue of identity is actually a, a big opportunity to sort of carve out a small part of the API uh, that you can ship into production and then build on top of. Um, so I, so that, that's actually a great question. Thanks. That's a, that's a good example. So we see with um, Capital One in the US, one of the first uh, APIs that they've opened up on their uh, API platform is a, a is an identif uh, identity yeah. API because it's what they've done is I, they've identified that one of their core assets is that trust and reputation almost. Okay. So then they're turning they're finding a way to turn that asset into an API or you know make that into a service. That's and then amazing. here we heard today um, BBVA also one of their early API uh, open APIs is an identity. Um, API as well. How would you, so you're saying that, okay, the standards have got to be sort of bottom up from actually building stuff and come up that sort of way. Then, so when they, when, when banks, uh, the, if some of our audience are sitting there with um, some of their business and some of their technical people and they're trying to identify where are the low risk opportunities to start testing and trying to build these uh, build sort of prototype products around and that sort of thing. Is there any, besides identity, what other ones or how did they get started in that? Do they map out? We talked a little bit earlier today as well about um, mapping out the developer's customer journey. Yeah, I mean, uh, so that's, that's another good question. So, I mean, obviously developers are a type of user for the banks and the APIs, but actually I, I think uh, it needs to be a sort of deeper level of, of product involvement. So I think you really need to be thinking about what kind of customers do we have, actual like end customers do we have, what kind of partners do we want to integrate with, what do those partners look like? What kind of contractual um, kind of uh, engagements do we need to have with those third parties? But I think you really need to start with like the actual end customer. So are we trying to retain customers? Are we trying to acquire customers? Those are the kind of product questions that people should be asking. So then that ties in with, in this morning we heard from Paul Rowan who was talking about the impacts of PSD2 and the opportunities of a, um, of you know these sorts of programmable business models, he one suggestion he was trying to help the audience sort of conceptualise around it. If you if you look at something like agriculture and farming, then farming customers are great customers for banks, and increasingly agriculture is using farm management software. And if you're building in APIs, then you've got this whole intelligence around. Um, what can what farms can be lent loans based on their the li their livestock the weather conditions their crop yields all of that sort of stuff so yeah so it would it be so is that what you're saying there so that if they're sitting if the bank's sitting down and thinking through okay we've got these established customer bases that we want to um, continue growing or you know is that the sort of thing you mean by identifying some of the customer Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and the third parties should fall out of that. So I think you can only really figure out which kinds of third parties you want to interface with um, if you figure out what your own customer looks like and what kind of third parties they're depending on. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big part of the discovery process that, that everybody should be going through. From it. And that's what I mean when I say you should take a, a product-first a product approach. Okay, cool. So then we could almost, you could almost also use then the, so if you're doing that sort of customer mapping, once you get through a little bit of that, you can go back to what we saw from Temenos today as well, where they had the map of like um, one of the eventual business models for banks would be a 
enterprise to enterprise sort of platform mm -hmm. um, ecosystem sort of thing. So on that one, they the map had a set of all of the different sorts of third party providers that are out there. But yep. I mean, there'd be a bigger map as well. But like that might be a starting point. You know, once you've done this customer mapping, yep. you then go to your third party ecosystem map and identify who might be the ones. Oh, absolutely, to I, know, I know Terminos are on board with this yep. with this with this entire philosophy. So. Yep. Anyone else? We've got a little bit of time. Hi, uh, it's Mike Kennedy from PwC. Uh, I was here last year and I've been to a number of API conferences and hackathons. And the thing that I've noticed this time around is a lot of people talking about the relationship with the and building up of an ecosystem and partnering to get become successful here. And that is really encouraging, actually. We're starting to move away from just what is the technology that's needed here and how do we make this a proper, successful business proposition. And I think that is a key theme that's coming across to me today, which I think is great.